I started racing really young and it was pretty much all I had ever done. Like I dabbled in school, but I never really committed because I was committed to cycling and I felt like I put a lot of things by the wayside. I wasn't sure if I wanted to, if it was the bike that I didn't like anymore or if it was just the place that I was doing it. Joining us in the studio today is an American racing cyclist who rides for the American amateur team, Legion of Los Angeles. She's also the sister of fellow racing cyclist, Kendall Ryan, and she's been crushing it on two wheels since 2007. Please welcome Alexis Ryan. Alexis, welcome hey. to the studio. Thank you for having me. It's so good to see you and, uh, and welcome to the show. Thanks. Alexis, where do we find you in the world today? I'm currently at home in Athens, Georgia. I moved here in 2020, actually, at the height of the pandemic. What brought you to Athens? My partner, Ty, has been living here for the last 12 years. He also races for Legion of Los Angeles. Um, and I was based in Girona at the time and going back and forth between Girona and California, which is where I'm from originally. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I moved here and I'm loving it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Where were you? You were born in California. Yeah, born in Ventura, California, uh, nice. about an hour north of Los Angeles. And what did your parents do growing up? Uh, my dad worked for the phone company, which changed names many times, but ended up being Verizon. Um, my mom was a flight attendant for a long time and also cool. an insurance broker, many things. Cool. And did you spend most of your childhood in Ventura or California? Yeah, I grew up there. I lived there from age zero to 25. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So. Tell us about some of the things, activities or sport that you were into as a kid. Um, my Dad is a very athletic guy, and he pretty much tried every single sport during his lifetime and wanted us to try every single sport. Um, we played soccer growing up. Uh, we, as in my brother and sister, um, played soccer. We ran cross country. We dabbled in karate for a little bit. Um, and then we did some Iron Kid triathlons, did some swimming. And uh, my dad was raising three of us, and he couldn't train for Ironmans anymore, so he focused on cycling, which was always his worst leg of the Ironman. Um, so we grew up racing bikes. Nice, nice. Did you, when you discovered cycling, did you think that that was it, like you always wanted to be a cyclist, or were there other things you wanted to do as a kid? There were a lot of other things I wanted to do as a kid. I think early on when we started riding, you know, I learned to ride and then it became like a family activity and it was fun. And we go to the bike path along the beach and ride and look at the dolphins out in the ocean. Um, and then it got a little bit more serious. We were going to all the criteriums every weekend in Southern California. And once I hit teenage years, I started to kick back a little bit and I didn't want to go. I wanted to go to birthday parties and go to the mall and hang out with my friends. And, but my dad's more stubborn than I am. So I ended up going to the bike races instead. <laughs> um, so I, I had a bit of a rebellious period. I didn't think that I wanted to do it. Um, but as I got older, I realized how much I really enjoyed riding the bike and how much it had become a part of my life. And I couldn't really imagine not riding and not racing and not doing what I, I grew to love it. I don't right, think it was right. instant love, but I grew to love it for sure. Well, you, so you love cycling a ton, obviously, but if you weren't cycling, is there another career that you might pursue or that you'd like to pursue? I think probably in the next couple of years. Um, it's something that's always been close to my heart, but, um, I'll probably go into conservation. Um, 
I've always, I've always been a nature lover and I've always felt this intense need to protect what we have. Um, and also what we have in the natural world is part of why I love cycling so much because it allows you to be out there and, um, you know, traveled all over the world. I've seen a lot of beautiful places and everywhere I go, I'm reminded of like the simple fact that it needs to be protected because there are people out there that don't care to protect it. Um, so that's probably the direction that I'll head. I think I'll transition out of cycling and go back to school and, and do that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 It, it, when, when you were growing up, were, did, did you follow the sport of cycling and were there any, you know, heroes of the sport that you admired? Yeah, I, uh, so I started racing at, at the age of nine, turning 10, when you can get a USA cycling license and we did all disciplines. We did road, cyclocross, mountain bike, track. Yeah. And my biggest idol, which I actually discovered who she was through cyclocross was Mariana Voss. And I've always looked up to her and got to the point where I was racing against her in the same Peloton and riding against her. And at one point uh, I was doing some race in the Netherlands and something happened and we looked at each other and we made comments and we made a joke and we started laughing and I was like, Oh my God. I'm having a conversation with Mariana Boss. This is so freaking cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. I I was able to, you know, race with my childhood hero. That was a really cool experience. That is super cool. Do you and Marianne stay in contact? Would you call yourself friends now? Do you text each other? No, I, I wouldn't call ourselves. We, we're not friends, but I definitely admire her. And I think she knew who I was, um, but... That's beside the point. I, she's a great role model and someone I've always looked up yeah. to. Um, so, did your family grow up like watching the tour every year? Would you glue mm-hmm. yourselves to the screen and and just consume <laughs> it? Another one of my dad's crazy ideas was to ride the trainer while watching the Tour de France. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome! <laughs> so yeah, we would spend all summer watching the tour. Um, Did you ever ride like a whole stage, like the duration of a whole stage? Uh, probably. I mean, I'm guessing I blocked it from my memory if we did. Um, <laughs> but we were definitely, sit- I probably didn't pedal the whole time, right? I just sat there on the train yeah. not moving, just watching it. Um, uh, that's one way to condition your body though, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Just spin on the trainer for seven hours. <laughs> that's cool. I need I need to add that to my sprint list, trainer or, you know, or outdoors. Got outdoors. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, cool. Well, let's let's jump into my sprint section of the the podcast where I throw a bunch of this or that at you and you tell us what you prefer, okay? Okay. Starting with pancakes or waffles. Pancakes, sourdough. Oh, homemade? Yes, homemade. Uh, beer or wine? Beer. Wine in the winter. It's becoming wine season now, but usually beer. Yeah. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Tacos or burritos? Burritos. Spicy or mild? Spicy. Cold weather or hot weather? Mm. I'm going to go with hot. Rain or snow? Snow. Mountains or the beach? Well, see, I was spoiled growing up and I got both, but I'll probably choose mountains. (laughs) Uh, Big cities or quiet suburbs? Quiet countrysides? Yeah, that works. Cars or trucks? Cars. Pavement or dirt? Dirt. Oh, I don't know that I was going to guess that one. Gloves really? or gloveless? Well, I, I mean, I just, you know, because you're a road cyclist, but I guess you grew up doing everything. So you love dirt too. Yeah. 
Gloves or gloveless? Gloves. Clipped in or flat pedals? Clipped in. Low pressure or high pressure in your tires? Low, pre low pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Fix it yourself or take it to a mechanic? Fix it myself. Ooh, nice. All right, let's transition now to your cycling career. So you've discovered the joy of cycling. It's become a, a family passion. You're doing it together. You're riding the trainer, watching the Tour de France as a family. At some point, you start to race and you start to get noticed. Tell us about that moment where you went sort of from amateur to like, a serious pro cyclist. What happened? Who recruited you? What was that? What was that onboarding look like? I, well, through my ent entire junior career, I was pretty average. I'd say, like, we'd go to nationals and I'd get fifth place or fourth place. Or, I never won. Um, and then I hit fifteen. And I won a couple of cyclocross national championships. So that kind of bumped my confidence a little bit. And then as a 17, 18, my goal was to go to the junior world championships. And I did it. I went and won the road race and the crit both years of 17, 18. And I was noticed by Kurt Stockton, who was oh, yeah. the director of now in Novartis. Um, so my first year as a professional, I raced for them and, uh, that was still one of the most fun years I've had on a bike. Um, and then the team folded, unfortunately, and I was picked up by UHC and Rachel Heal. And that first year on the team, um, I had my biggest, most traumatic cycling accident. I was racing for the national team in the Netherlands in the Energiebach tour. And I hit a street sign and snapped my humerus in half and collapsed my zygomatic arch. And I was out for seven months with, with a, it was broken the entire time because they botched the surgery in the Netherlands. Oh. So then I had to have two more. And I wasn't really sure if I was going to race again because um, it, I mean, my arm was broken and it felt like it had been broken my whole life. I was like very yeah. dramatic about it. And I was just like, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I'm going to keep doing this. this is, I, I took classes at community college while I was injured and, um, you know, then Luckily, Rachel Heal was like, you know what? I want to give you another chance because you didn't really get to show us what you're made of. Yeah, and yeah. that's when I decided that I was going to keep going. Um, so I raced again in 2015, I think, for UHC. And I had a pretty good year. And then I was noticed by some of the riders on King SRAM. Or it was then specialized Lululemon. Right. They, they noticed me in the Peloton. They noticed that I was at the front in the echelons. Um, and just pretty much the entire time during these Dutch races. And they told the director, Ronnie Lauka about me. And he talked to me at the end of that trip and gave me a contract. And there I was chipping off to Europe. So I had awesome. no idea what I was in for. <laughs> um, so awesome. Yeah, but it just, I didn't really think too hard about it. It just kind of felt right. Um, what year was I, that, that, that Ronnie reached out? That was the end of 2015. So 2016 was my first year on the team. Um, and you moved to Girona then? No. So I, first I went to Sittard because I still wasn't making that much money. I was a first year World Tour pro. and. Um, on very minimal salary. Right. So I stayed at the USA Cycling National Team House in Sittard. Right. And I cracked after a couple months living there. <laughs> and I had some friends that lived in Girona, and one of them told me to just come stay with her. And uh, 
the rest is kind of history. I never left Girona. I ended up getting my own apartment there the next couple of years. And um, yeah, then I raced on Canyon for seven years. Amazing. Yeah. Long time. Amazing. Six cool. Years. So that's kind of that's kind of how you began. What would you say? What were some of the the highlight accomplishments on the bike during those times? Is there a particular race or series that you remember that sticks out? Yeah, the I made the the world championship team a couple times as an elite. Um, Amazing. Not as many as I would have hoped, but I also more of a classics rider and I, I didn't really fit the parkours for certain world championships. Um, but the, what the world championship that I auto qualified for was in Switzerland and, or sorry, Aust- is it Austria. I can't remember. Um, but the race that that happened at, I was second at Ronda Van Drentha to Amy Peters. Actually, we, wow drag race to the line for the last like 300 meters. And I've never been so proud to lose to somebody before. Yeah. Like she is such an incredible competitor and I've always looked up to her. Um, so to be able to stand next to her on the podium, I was like, Oh my God, I got second place to Amy Peters. <laughs> so That's that was so awesome. probably one of, I, I had a, such a great race that day. And um, I'm really really proud of that one. And I actually won the UCI 1.1 two days before that, that was in the same region. Oh, wow. That was a really, uh, that was a really great weekend. Yeah. Um, that crash that you had on the bike where you broke a bunch of stuff. Um, was that the scariest moment that you've ever had on the bike or have you had others? I, that probably wasn't, the scariest moment. It was definitely the most physically traumatic. Um, I mean, I was pretty messed up, but, uh, I'd say I had a couple bad crashes, actually one in one of my final years at the, the Madrid challenge. Um, it was like two or three days for the women end of 20, end of 2020, actually. And I, uh, we were coming into one of the, the 180s, the U-turns, and we were going like 30, 35 miles an hour, and I was at the front, and I hit this tree root. It was like growing under the road, and was this huge lip, Ooh. and I didn't, s- and we had gone around this plenty of times, and I don't know why this time it suddenly bucked me, but I hit it, and my hands went flying And I was laying on my handlebars and I was already like so cracked after the year because of of the pandemic and like everything that was was associated with it. And I was going down and it hurt so bad and I hit my head and I got a concussion. And it was like, that was probably one of the the scariest moments just because I was already mentally like not unstable, but not happy. And, um, yeah, that was probably one of the worst worst ones I've ever had. So crazy. Yeah. What what was the you you referenced in your earlier crash, you referenced the broken humerus and some other thing that I couldn't remember the pronunciation <laughs> of. What the zygomatic, was that? Zygomatic zygomatic arch, which is what, basically what is your that? cheekbone. Oh. This arch here underneath your your eye socket. And apparently when you collapse it, sometimes they can just go in and pop it back out and it pops back into place. Other times it's collapsed too much. And when they go to pop it back out, it just collapses again. So they had to put a plate. I still have it somewhere in here. Little micro plate in my face. I still have the, uh, I still have the plate in my arm too. I oh got yeah, this big old scar coming down here. Oh yeah. yeah. Welcome to cycling. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Uh, are, are there things that are there things that you've learned about yourself while riding 
that have helped you overcome certain challenges? You know, what is it that keeps you on the bike? What is it that you look inward to, to keep you going and to keep you strong and to keep you fast? I mean, I want to say that the, one of the biggest assets that I've learned is how to focus and be able to compartmentalize things. You know, when you're on the bike and you're out there suffering for four or five hours, yeah, somehow you've got to focus and compartmentalize because otherwise those five hours are not going to pass by. And that's helped me a lot just in life in general. Um, I've noticed, and even my friends that don't ride say this about me. I start doing something and I get into the zone or the flow state that everybody talks about. And I just push ahead. And if there's something that needs to get done, I do it until the very end and I check all the boxes. Right. And I think that's something that's really important that cycling's taught me about life is like, you've got these things that sometimes you don't want to do, but you just put your head down and push forward. Um, that's great. Yeah. That's great advice. Have you ever wanted to quit? I think... This is supposed to be an emotional podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, but 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 we embrace all emotions, happy and sad, and happy sad. We can Crying edit. We can edit this. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave it in. To be honest, if, it's fine if I can get my words if out. If you keep um, if you keep crying, I'm gonna start crying. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, I just told myself that I taught myself to compartmentalize things. <laughs> Put it in a box. Tell yourself to stop crying. Box. Yeah. Um, I think 2020 was a really hard year for a lot of people. And um, I, can, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. You can totally um, do this. Finish line is like five minutes away. It's not far. Yeah. Um, and I, I know a lot of people that really struggled in the professional cycling world with like coming to terms with what this catastrophic event caused in their lives and in the world. And I was like, all right, well, here's this thing that's killing people and what really matters in my life. Like, yes, I love cycling and I love professional cycling and I love racing at the highest level, but what really matters is like the people that you love yeah, and being with them and spending time with them and not missing out on that part of life. And when you're a professional athlete, you miss a lot of that. And I think what made me that year made me realize what actually mattered to me. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep doing it. Um, just because I had already given up like most of my life, you know, I started racing really young and, um, yeah. and it was pretty much all I had ever done. Like I dabbled in school, but I never really committed because I was committed to cycling. And I felt like I, I put a lot of things by the wayside and, um, 2020 was like, or 2021 was really, really hard for me to get through. Like I flew back from Europe to the US like five or six times because I just couldn't, I couldn't be over there anymore. And, um, and I kind of feel bad with like the way that I left racing in Europe, but I just, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, it wasn't worth it for me to be over there for like three months at a time and not be with my partner who I love and not be with my animals who bring me like so much joy and I couldn't even plant a garden because I didn't have a garden. You know, it's, right, it's just right. like the little things in life that bring you so much joy or I couldn't 
volunteer with a local organization because I couldn't commit to volunteer hours. It's like right. simple things. And it's hard because it, it means a lot to race, to do anything at the top level, at the world level. It, it means a lot, right? And a lot of people look up to you. And it's something that can make or break your whole life. And uh, I don't know if I'm getting off on a tangent here, but no, no, you're I wasn't doing great. sure. If, I wasn't sure if I wanted to, if it was the bike that I didn't like anymore, or if it was just the place that I was doing it. If that makes right. sense, like right. And you know, my partner was really supportive throughout the whole thing, and he was like, you know, Alexis, you don't, you don't have to race in Europe. Like, it's something that a lot of people build up in their minds like it's the ultimate goal and like that's the only place in cycling that you really want to be is racing in Europe and it's amazing but there's a lot of stuff that comes with it that's just not worth it right in the grand scheme of things and um I was like you know what okay I've been over here for six seven years like I've done pretty much every race that I could ever imagine, except of course, then they had the women's tour de France and Perry Roubaix <laughs> and all this shit. It's like, damn it. <laughs> but since coming back to America and racing here, I've realized that it wasn't the, it wasn't the bike. The bike is the answer. It was just where I was doing it. And I'm so much happier. And I know that I still love riding and I love racing and I've, I'm glad I came through that because it was a really hard time in my life. And, you know, it's, I'm glad I'm slowly putting it behind me and I'm sorry that I just bawled my eyes out. No, you, you know what? That was, that uh, uh, Alexis, that was super special. And I'm thankful that you shared that with us. Um, I'm a firm believer that you know, everything happens for a reason and everything's a stepping stone to something else. Mm -hmm. And, and that everything always works out best or better in the end. Mm -hmm. But those moments sometimes are traumatic when you can't see what the end looks like. Mm -hmm. But if you have faith, if you have trust, if you have people that love and support you around you, there's there's nothing we can't do, right? And yeah, and look at you now. I mean, look at the look at what you overcame. Whether were those emotions or environment or culture or pandemic? You overcame that. You made some hard decisions, and you came back to the states. And look at you, you're crushing it, and Legion's yeah. crushing it, and the the legacy that you and the team are building right now is going to last forever. The waves that you guys are making right now, they're they're incredible. So congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I've I've realized that it took me a little while to come to terms with, you know, such a big decision, such a massive life change. But it's been it's been worth it. This team is worth it. The sponsors that support us are worth it. But definitely the vision of what the Williams brothers have in mind is hopefully going to change the world for the better. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun to watch and it's fun to be a part of for sure. Let's, uh, let's talk about your sister. So you have a sister that's on the same mm. team as you. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Huh? I'm, I'm assuming you, you're super competitive with one another, but, but how does that work? We're not, I wouldn't say we're that competitive with each other, to be honest. I, we're old. I would like to say that we're old enough and mature enough that if either one of us wins, we're both happy. And yeah. that's kind of, it's kind of the mentality on Legion to begin with is whoever wins the race, that's, it doesn't matter as long as it's us. As long you as know? it's and one of us. As long as it's one of us, we're good. And if it wasn't one of us, then what did we do wrong and how can we be better? Yeah. Um, but it's been, it's been fun and interesting racing with my sister because we, we never have been on the same team except when we were juniors, which doesn't really count. Yeah. Um, 
So it's, it's been fun. And, and you have another sibling as well, right? What, what do they do? Yeah, I have a brother. Um, he used to race. Uh, he actually raced for, do you remember when the Bahati Foundation was oh, around? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was, on, he was on that team for the year that it was around. Um, but he, he chose getting an education, and he's now a mechanical engineer for nice yeah for a really nice. really cool company so cool cool mm-hmm. do uh are you and kendall also like best friends no <laughs> <laughs> no nah, kendall and i are i wish you could have a conversation with her because you would understand that we're very very different yeah um we'll but, add her to the list yeah, I we're very different, but we we're also close in a way that we're not afraid to share everything with each other. So I guess we are close. Um, yeah, but we've spent we spent the last most of our adult lives away from each other. So that's been kind of hard when we get back together. It feels like we've grown apart a lot, but it's it's been good that we've been teammates because it feel like it's brought us closer together as close as we've been in years at least yeah that's cool Mm -hmm. let's uh let's shift gears to sort of the the finale of this ride together and let's talk about some of the yeah let's change gears (laughs) um i try not to overuse that um but yeah let's change gears um alexis you talked a lot about you know things that you care most about you know the environment and conservation being being high up there but tell me about are there any you know organizations or causes that you're super involved in you know what are what are you doing off the bike to make this little planet of ours a better place um well big one is cycle kids which is legion has partnered with cycle kids this year um and they're a really incredible organization because they get they establish cycling programs in schools. I think they're generally elementary or middle school. Mm -hmm. Um, But we get to kickstart each program, not each program, but many programs in the cities that we go to. Um, So we did a couple this year. We did one in Tulsa and um, it's, we, the people, people that ride take, for granted the ability to be able to ride a bike and the accessibility, uh, to a bike. And these kids, like I, I taught a 13 year old girl how to ride in an hour and she figured it out. And you could tell she blossomed in the hour that we were together from having zero confidence to pedaling around the parking lot and like going off road into the grass and the dirt and, you could like see that joy bubbling up in her. And when her mom came to pick her up, she had this big old smile on her face and she was like, ah, I rode a, I wanted to ride a bike. And we saw that in a couple kids. Um, so that's really special. I mean, I, I wish when I was growing up that we had a cycling program in schools and it's, it's something that's really important. And, you know, I think a lot of people can agree that the bicycle can change the world. You know, it's not something that you just use as a form of exercise. It's something that you can use as transportation and recreation and whatever. There's, there's all sorts of ways that the bike can apply to life um, and improve the world. Tell me more about cycle kids. So do you give bikes to kids that don't have bikes? No. So the school program that is established, the teachers learn the curriculum of like how to teach these kids bicycle safety and the basics of riding. And the organization gives, I think it's about 20 bikes, pretty indestructible bikes to the school. And so the school then owns 20 bikes. Right. And then it becomes a part of the physical education criteria. And so you guys roll in in a city that you might be racing in and you go and you meet with kids and you either teach them the basics of safety or, or even just how to ride. Is that, is that how it works? Yeah. So we, we show up and generally when we get there, all the bikes are in boxes 
and the kids come and we build the bikes with them. So that's also wow. part of the experience, which is pretty cool. Like they get to learn how to put something together. Yeah. Um, so we help them build the bikes and then they get to ride them and then they get to ride them ideally every day, like five days a week when they go to school during the awesome. year. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's called cycle kids. Cycle kids. Yeah. Cool. Cool. We'll put the, we'll put the link in the show notes on this podcast. Yeah. What, really what else are there any, are there any other organizations or, or causes that you're involved in that you want to share? Um, nothing right now. I, I did a lot of conservation work when I was living in California. Um, but I didn't move here in the most ideal year. So I right. haven't really been able to find another organization doing the same kind of work. Um, but I've, I've done a few volunteers days with this organization called rivers alive, um, which promotes access to clean water and keeping the river systems clean. Right. Um, so I, once I figure it out, I'll post it on the web and hopefully people can awesome. support it. Yeah. Awesome. Alexis, you also mentioned a love for animals, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you have any, do you have any pets? Yeah, uh, we've got two dogs and a cat. Dogs and cats living together in the same roof. Living together. I wish I could, but I have got a video that I took earlier of our dog and our cat playing together. Um, no way. Yeah. That's uh, cool. We actually just, we had one dog and a cat, and then a couple months ago, a, a stray pit little puppy was walking by our house, and of course, I ran out there with some treats and was like... <laughs> And then we ended up with a second dog. <laughs> that happens. So, yeah. Do you have any do you have any nicknames? No, I don't. I'm just Alexis. What is, what does Kendall call you? Arexis. Yeah. Arexis. Talks, Arexis. No, nah, she just of, calls me Alexis. Because of crashing or No. I don't I don't know where <laughs> she got it from. People just call me Alexis. I don't really have any nicknames. You can give me one if you want. Well, you know what they say about nicknames, right? You don't get to choose. They get they get given to you. Exactly. So exactly. Something has to happen where it where it happens. Well, Alexis, this has been awesome. Um, we are just about out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your your story. And um, I love it. It's great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And. Um, have an awesome rest of your day and uh, good luck with the rest of the season. Thank you. All right. Take care. Take care.